uh, today we have our another new episode and we will discuss on augmented reality and virtual reality we have our world famous speaker mr anthony uh, first i would like to ask him the question about what are the primary difference between augmented reality and virtual reality well that's interesting because now we are going into the domain and sphere of metaphysics cosmology and quantum mechanics because we in a sense are living in a virtual reality so i think this is an incredible way to start from a philosophical perspective in fact what is reality does the mind construct reality how much of reality is actually real in fact the human eye is a camera it forms an image of the outer world on its sensitive screen the retina which is at the back of the eye and then transmits the information to the brain so we have this feedback loop process so consciousness is the continual creation of models feedback loops which describe a model of our place in space and time thus if you want to understand the secrets of the universe in terms of reality at a cosmological scale think of it in terms of energy frequency and vibration energy frequency and vibration now all things exist as a dichotomy of mass and energy in a continuum of space and time existence is mass energy motion and space time space time is an electromagnetic field zero point electromagnetic quanta so the universe is a continuum with the future coming into existence photon by photon we're talking about light energy here this forms the movement of positive and negative charge with the continuous flow of electromagnetic fields with the continuous flow of electromagnetic field fields excuse me thus thus the arrow of time and all of reality is formed by the quantum wave particle function with the future continually coming into existence time is continuously being formed by the spontaneous absorption and admission of light waves so i'm coming now from a very profound philosophical perspective now due to the laws of quantum mechanics and relativity we now know that empty space is in fact not empty it's a bubbling brew of virtual particles that are popping in and out of existence all the time now this can only happen within the world of quantum mechanics it couldn't happen within our world a classical world because it would violate the laws of energy so you have these virtual particles popping in and out of existence a bubbling brew of virtual particles popping in and out of existence all the time so the universe is essentially a giant superconductor the universe that, that 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 encapsulates our very existence our very reality is a giant cosmic superconductor it's an electromagnetic field we are living in a sense in a virtual reality now each point in space contains information every single point in space contains information the space can store energy in fields these fields are magnetic electrical electromagnetic and gravitational so there's this invisible field everywhere in the universe and this invisible invisible field in a sense ultimately defines and represents all of reality so in a real sense we are living in a virtual reality in a sense we are living in a virtual reality governed by a greater power then we're going into theology god be the 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 giver of life and he is operating through the quantum world in, in this in a in quotes in a sense a virtual reality thus there is an invisible field everywhere in the universe everywhere in space and as i said this invisible field in a sense as we have discovered through the laws of quantum mechanics governs all of reality and so forth so in a sense we are living in a virtual reality in fact if you amplify frequency you change the structure of matter so matter in a, in a real sense is actually nothing but an illusion governed by metaphysical theological properties which now we're going into space and time and a, a greater power that dwells beyond space and time so everything is ultimately made up of atoms subatomic particles quirks and gluons and so forth particles strings of light oscillating with a frequency of which we are all part a symphony of sounds within a complex universe of multiple dimensions and infinite realities oh my goodness this is my favorite subject right uh, another interesting philosophical uh, question is this and again we, we've mentioned this before the whole notion of a matrix are we living in a virtual reality well actually when it comes to the matrix the answer is no we're not living in a matrix it's impossible to model the physics of the universe on, on even the biggest computer there are just not enough electrons out there to model the universe in a computer program basically there are not enough particles in the known universe that could sustain the computing power necessary for a simulation of this scale but in a sense we are living in a virtual reality in the sense from, that we live in a giant cosmic super conductor so this is very 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 important to know very very important to know that actually all of reality can be defined by this invisible field by this incredible invisible field and i will just very quickly reiterate what i had said the universe is a continuum with the future coming into existence photon by photon we're talking about light energy here photon by photon this forms the movement of positive and negative charge with the continuous flow of electromagnetic fields the universe is an electromagnetic field 
zero point electromagnetic quanta. Thus, the arrow of time is formed by the quantum wave particle function with the future continually coming into existence. Basically, I'll stop here now. Time is constantly being formed by the spontaneous absorption and emission of light, which ultimately defines all of reality. Okay, <laughs> that's my opening speech. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I think pretty much summarizes it, but there you go. Thank you, Mr. Robin Daly. What I want to discuss about uh, augmented reality and virtual reality. My question is what are some popular applications of augmented reality technology in various industries? Sure. Um, augmented reality reality kind of hit its um, stride with uh, HoloLens from Microsoft in terms of industrial applications. Now, Microsoft's withdrawn from the from the product and the effort, though Lenovo still has has theirs, and the, and the units are still used to a large extent on manufacturing lines and for, for remote repair. And that's really where augmented reality outside of entertainment is currently playing. It, it's playing in the field um, to be able to provide remote advice and consultation for field engineers that are working on projects. And what happens is the headset that you're using um, has a camera on it. It sees what the user is looking at. And then the, rem the remote advisor, increasingly uh, uh, an AI, um, provides a context. So when they're looking at, say, looking at an engine and they've got to take the engine apart in a certain way uh, using particular tools and, um, and, and particular levels of force, uh, in their head-mounted display, they see the item they have to work on highlighted. They see an image of a tool that they should use to work on it. And then any conditions that should be applied. For instance, if it's a torque wrench they have to use, uh, right there on the display is the amount of torque that has to be set into the wrench uh, so that they can do th they can do the job and and it becomes a bridge to full automation because that same training set once it's taken beyond a remote operator or, or an advisor and moves to a, an ai providing the advice automatically then the step to take take that one step further and remove the person or replace them with a robot is relatively easy because the you've already got all the underlying elements. It, it's just a matter of, of changing the human out for a machine that takes direction as opposed to a human that's provided with direction. So the, so the, um, so that's kind of way, where AR is now. Uh, VR is a little different. Um, oh, and on the entertainment side, you do have things like Pokemon Go that have come and gone and, and a few other things. We've, we've got uh, jewelry that registers with the AR headset and will do things like show you a flying dragon or, or whatever haven't been terribly popular except for those those intermediate uh, runs of things like Pokemon Go, which was really popular for a while until people started walking off cliffs and off the edges of buildings. And I think some of that stuff in terms of liability was rethought. Um, when we get to VR, it's a bit different. So a AR, AR is a really a case of doing overlays. Um, you have a window into reality and then there's an overlay that gives you additional information, additional context. Um, um, and whatever it is you're doing, it's, it's relatively low power. Uh, you can run AR glasses off a smartphone pretty easily um, and self-contained AR implementations are common. Uh, VR is a bit more difficult. Uh, the VR now takes, and, and we're gonna add mixed reality here in a minute, but VR creates an entire virtual environment. Um, for the most part, it doesn't have to take into account anything that's in reality. But the fact of the matter is, is it, the normal user using it kind of needs to know there's furniture in their way. In fact, you can go on YouTube and, and pretty much consistently see people destroying their televisions as they're swing, swinging at their VR images and, and forgetting that there's things around them that will break. Um, so uh, VR has been more interesting. Uh, Facebook is the meta is the major driver on the consumer side for VR. Um, you go to uh, Varjo on the commercial side, probably has one of the better solutions with regard to VR on um, on commercial, though there are other people that clearly play in that space. Uh, VR can be used for training, um, pretty heavily for training. That you can place the, the user in an environment uh, and depending on the surroundings, you can take them through relatively complex um, uh, demonstrations of technology, uh, environments, uh, scenarios, I guess the word I'm looking for and see how they're going to perform in the scenario and then provide guidance and training. So for instance, it, it, VR has been used in, in back 20 years uh, for military, um, military and particularly aircraft training. And the, and the uh, uh, though in many cases without the headset, more using screens around um, um, a, an actual cockpit that's been removed from a plane and the, uh, or been constructed to look like a plane, a plane cockpit, um, which is done in the, in the commercial side. 
um, and in the fighter side. So the, so this allows you to cut down on the cost of fuel for, for, uh, for putting up an aircraft. It allows you to put the aircraft into incredibly dangerous scenarios like heavy slit, heavy hail, heavy fog, uh, landing with partial lights. If you were to do that in, in reality, which they kind of used to do with hoods um, and still do in, in, in terms of private plane training, um, the, it, you could have a mistake and, and there is a risk you could lose the aircraft and the, and the flight crew. Um, not to mention anybody that's also on the plane. With 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 VR, you can you can create incredibly dangerous environments, um, deadly environments, and everybody lives because there's no there's no risk to the crew, crew or the uh, or the system. So the so the those those are those two elements. Now we've got something called mixed reality, and and mixed reality is a superset. Mixed reality typically has a right now, though you can do it different ways. But right now, a mixed reality headset, which is kind of what Meta has put forward in MetaQuest. And what Apple has created in um, in their uh, in their VR Vision, um, what the hell it's called, the, their Vision product, uh, the um, though they lack co VR content at the moment, uh, the um, they have got cameras. Uh, the the cameras then interpret the environment around the user and then blend it with whatever the user is seeing. This is probably the more practical aspect in terms of long term use. But it is incredibly processor intensive uh, the, because you have you have it could, latency is your killer. I mean, if you take all the time in the world, you could scan your environment, you could render render a scene, and then play the scene back for the individual. And, and as long as you had a couple hours to do all of that, you could do that in a relatively low tech way. Um, but that's not how we do it this way. We have to do it real time, and so that means that the the cameras have to capture an image. The image has to be reconstructed uh, and then provided to the user in high definition, so it looks real, but has may have nothing to do with what the what the thing is that users looking at. So they might be looking at a, a typical building downtown, maybe the the the, um, uh, the the central office for the city, and instead they're seeing a castle with a moat with dragons flying overhead, um, and and the dragons could be just reconversions of of birds or applied just on the on the fly, and the and done right, the user has no ability to tell the difference uh, with, with a couple issues. Uh, so right now where VR is in terms of creating an immersion ex immersive experience, it's fairly strong visually. Um, uh, mixed reality is, is reasonably strong visually, but to create an immersive experience, you have to engage the rest of the senses. At the very least, you have to engage touch. And, the, and, um, and there has been kind of the problem the industry has been dealing with. Uh, Zuckerberg, is, Zuckerberg has recognized that this is a problem and has put a, a lot of uh, energy into trying to create, um, for lack of a better term, Waldos or, or uh, human interfaces that will allow you to strap on something, at least give you the sense that if you touch something, it kind of feels solid to you. But it, but it, but it, but it's not really engaging your fingertips yet. So it, you're constricted. So you, you see an object. Let's say, for instance, if you saw a balloon, it would. Can deconstruct. I mean, if we put applied pressure on it, it would, it would apply pressure on on the balloon, but you wouldn't feel the the, the rubber. So the so the so it breaks reality. And so the and so the so as of right now, we're having real trouble doing that final blend. Really trying to engage the senses, smell, touch, um, taste would be interesting, but but I don't think that's as critical as the others. And the and the um, and of course we can do we can do sound. But the goal, but the goal is, of course, is to provide all of that so you don't feel the headphones, you don't feel the headset, and it's much more like a holodeck experience. If you've ever watched uh, Star Trek: Next Generation and some of the other follow-on uh, series, which had the holodeck, uh, but it started back then. And the, and so, the the right now where the science is is we really are, are well short of immersion. Uh, that we have some technologies that that kind of address some of these problems. Um, LED walls. Uh, for instance, um, allow uh, an actor to step into a scene and feel more like they're part of the scene. But you, but you're still going to have the camera crew uh, on one of the on one of the walls, and and so the the immersion level, in terms of a of a participant, is low. In terms of an actor trying to interact with the scene, it's perhaps a little bit easier to to interact with a monster that actually or a, uh, say a dinosaur that looks like a dinosaur. And hanging over you, as opposed to a guy in a suit with a with a dinosaur head construct, which if you've ever seen some of those how things are made videos, uh, if I was an actor, and I, I'm just not too sure I wouldn't crack up if somebody came running at me in one of those suits, making sounds like they were a Tyrannosaurus Rex. So it, so immersion immersion remains uh, the problem. But where it works commercially, 
um, still is, is with training, engagement training, and it's still a ton cheaper than doing it, doing, you know, sending a soldier out in the field um, and, and risking injury or, um, or particularly with regard to, to aircraft, spaceships, and, um, and uh, both commercial and, and military aircraft. It's just, it's just a lot safer to use simulation at this level. Uh, now, Anthony was talking a bit about, about VR and AR and reality, and I do want to touch on one thing because we work on, on those concepts quite a bit. Um, recognize you don't have to, if you wanted to create a virtual universe, you wouldn't have to create a virtual universe. All you have to do is convince the user, the observer, that they've got a virtual universe, and that really reduces the amount of work you have to do. Um, we do have Earth 2 as a, as a viable construct now. Uh, it's been built, and the, and the belief initially when Earth 2 was started, we were going to have to use quantum computing uh, to get to the uh, to get to, to make it viable. Not anymore. That what that turns out uh, even with generate, we're not at at, uh, at, at um, uh, general AI yet, artificial general AI yet. But with just generative AI, we're five to ten years out of of um, AGI. Uh, but the uh, but even with generative AI, we have been able to do a pretty decent job. Of of creating Earth two and and uh, and if you are if you were to observe Earth two from the from the ground, I, you'd be challenged to know that you were in a in a in a construct. So the so that's so all you have to do is you you just have to intercept the intercept the senses of a human, which Musk is working on at the moment. I have some doubts whether it's going to work, but that but if you can intercept the senses of a human, you you can convince them they're in any place. So the so the and that's all you've got to do, and that's something we have the comp computational power for. We just don't have the interfaces built yet. We we need a kind of an API for humans, and that while well, we're working on it, um, and we've made progress. Uh, the the uh, the latest work with with MRIs uh, and brain mapping does indicate there is a way to create an interface into the brain that is much more direct than anything we've done before. Uh, the problem is, it appears that everybody's brain is different enough that the training cost per individual is exorbitant. And so the and so it's not like you can walk in and build just had a great experience and then you could walk in and have that same virtual experience. Uh, the the uh, we're not there. But but that but with a lot of training you can come close. So that so that at least in theory. So the so the so we, we are we are close to being able to create a, a matrix. And of course a lot of the discussion in the community is how do we know it hasn't already happened? How do we know that we're not each sitting in, inside a machine and and, um, and our perception of reality is uh, is fully artificial and and everything we say, see is constructed and the fact of the matter is there's no way to tell uh, the the, uh, the folks that, that that have challenged this back and forth who come to the conclusion that if you're inside the only way you're going to be able to tell if you're in a simulation is to somehow escape the simulation the because once you're in the simulation everything you see touch and feel is simulated to you and, and under control of whatever controls the simulation and so there, there's no way for the occupant uh to be able to you can break theories about it but that but you, you could easily dispel the operator could easily dispel the theories by providing with different information and also depends on how much control they have over over your thinking process so the so the uh, so the end result is at least from my understanding if if uh, if we were in a simulation we would have no capability of being able to to definitively determine it. And for a lot of us, it just comes down to, well, then if you can't determine it, then why the hell does it matter? <laughs> so so it, it is what it is. But right now where AR and VR is, is mostly for uh, for AR, it's it's mostly for uh, for in-field support. Um, and for VR, it, there is a, a stronger um, uh, commercial, excuse me, um, uh, a stronger entertainment element to VR, uh, but it's underperforming expectations and it's mostly used successfully for training. It's used for airport operations too, by the way. Um, but the uh, but it's mostly used for uh, for uh, for training right now, at least in terms of scale. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sharidan. What you want to discuss about augmented reality and virtual reality? Okay, I'm about PP, hold on. All right. Okay, let me pull my. Sorry, I have people here. Um, hello, Sheridan Tatsuno from San Francisco. Uh, I go back to what 2016 in virtual reality and augmented reality. Um, I co-founded a company called One Reality in Sweden, and we used um, we had th that. Our people have been using virtual reality since 1995 with the million-dollar machines, hundred-thousand-dollar headsets for sustainable city planning in Sweden. So they're the one of the most advanced sustainability engineering companies. And what we were using just you know, cheap laptops, two thousand-dollar laptops with you know the NVIDIA chips in there, 10 1080s back then. 
and uh, headsets, Quest headsets. So what we were doing is enterprise. So with um, AEC, architecture, engineering, construction. So we're developing sustainable cities in virtuality using the Unreal uh, 4.0 gaming engine. And uh, we did the Copenhagen Malmo port. We had a contract with them to design their whole new port. They're you know, a 30 mile long port for all the new container ships coming in. And they gave us the 3D scan in and they had all the data, um, AI data for you, all the utilities underground, you could see it underground. Uh, we had all the airlines, travel data, train data for Europe, and we had all the land use data. Um, and so we could zoom around, we could go underground, see the water going through the pipes in VR. So we were using that for planning in back in 2016. Um, and then we did the Lund 2070 plan where we use virtuality to design. They had a new synchrotron um, to design 15,000 units of housing plus light rail. So we created that. We dropped the boxes in and then we just use it for the urban footprint. And then we gave that to the architects. They designed the buildings and then we took their, their Revit models, CAD models, and just dropped them right in. So then you can walk inside the building when you went down. So we used to fly from outer space to right into Lund, go down the street, open a door, walk into the building or go to the elevator up, go into the room, which is all tricked out, and have either would be a party going on, music and CNN playing on the television. We had stereo. So we did that five years ago. We sold um, both built and unbuilt housing. So the the difference would be for the built housing, we, used, we scanned it in. And then we would use augmented reality because it's there in reality. So you'd walk around in the building to show homes and then people, you could just drop whatever you wanted. And then you could, um, we worked with the furniture companies so you could drop in furniture from, we had all the Swedish furniture companies, they have the CAD, CAD models. So a couple could walk into an empty built building already, AR, drop in any furniture and trick it out exactly what they wanted, and they could buy it right there, which the realtors like because they got extra revenues from the sales of, of furniture so and art. So it became somewhat like a Home Depot. AR is a Home Depot. We can buy anything and drop it in. And then for the unbuilt homes, we would design, we did social housing for the, um, what was it, the Syrian refugees. So they, there was a shortage of housing. And 150,000 people, and there are 10 to 12 people living per house. So we had to rush. And the good thing about virtual reality, it, it takes Sweden one year to design back and forth with approvals. We could do it in, well, we had the models already created studio one bedroom, two bedroom, three. You know, and we could build a 140 unit multi social housing for low income people. We could do it in one day. We just drop and drag because we already built it out. And then the good part is when it's unbuilt, you could move the thing. So uh, the couples could come in and say, we want to move the fridge right over here. We want the, the counter longer. We want it wider. We want windows over here so they could design their own building um, and then work with the architects. So that's one of the advantages of VR is that you can, it's still unbuilt. So um, you could actually pre-sell the homes, get the money up front to pay for the construction, because as you know, construction loans are very expensive. And then the danger is you have, you built the wrong stuff that nobody wants. Whereas when the VR, that's the trouble with the AR, you're stuck with what's built. So if you built it wrong, you're in, well, you're stuck with it. Whereas a VR, the couples could come in and build the housing exactly what they want, so they get exactly what they want when it's built. And then what we did is we used virtuality for the design like in Copenhagen, we'd have an empty lot in these old buildings, and we would design, you have to have historic um, continuity with facades, so we'd have the old historic facades, and then we would show that, and then the architects would build the building, and we would drop it in, and then we would we would test all the people, say, okay, which one's the real building, which one's not, and they, they couldn't tell, and they said, this is the one, and then we would take it out, because this is their digital data, and then it's empty lot, that's not built yet. But if, but so what we did is when you drop in the building in virtuality, you could walk around to the building, open the refrigerator, turn on the, you know, you could television, everything, everything's this automated. It's very high res too. It's not like the gaming engines, which are kind of fuzzy, but everything's like literally to the mic. And then you could see the wiring in rooms inside the walls and the plumbing 
because the gamers don't care about plumbing and things like that. But for architects, you have to have literally to the millimeter, you have to have exact placement of all wires plumbing. You can't be off by you no know, even a millimeter or two because then you have uh, shortages or you know blackouts. So we used to do that and work with our engine, electrical engineers so you could see everything in detail. And then the inspectors could come in and find inspectors to make sure that the wiring's proper according to the code, things like that. So it's very pragmatic. So um, now most our big architecture engine construction companies use digital twins. They use VR and AR the same way. So VR for visualizing, playing around. And then once construction comes underway, what we do is you have a lot and you have the virtual model that you're working against. And as it goes up, you could match it with the virtual model overlay. So you can see how, are, are you off two inches? You can actually lay it perfectly over. So as it's going up, you could see, and at the very end, you have the real model, and then you could just superimpose it with a virtual model to make sure it's exactly the way that you want it done. So we did it in tandem. And so for construction sites, the same thing. We use uh, VR for training. So, for example, for sites, construction sites, um, one of the big problems was electrocution. When the guys were running the pipes, they would hit a power line and they get killed immediately. And that was a big no-no. And -no. Uh, that's called a career-ending move for the developers. And it's a multi-million dollar lawsuit. And in Europe, is very tough on that one. So what we did is we had the construction site in VR. You practice training and then you're driving a tractor with that big pipe and you, they have big bright red lights and here's here's the power lines don't touch it bright red and then when you go to the real site they wear the ar goggles and you could see the power line where it's dangerous so you stay away from those things so that's you know those are pragmatic uses for vr ar um enterprise um and then right now i'm, I'm i won't go on further i'll let other people talk but i'm Work, I'm working with a German doctors. We're doing virtual hospitals of the future. So we have some in Dubai, Tokyo, and um, what is it? Les uh, Switzerland, and also, what is it? Tokyo, Lausanne, and Australia. But I, I'll put the link there and people could take a look at it. But anyway, that's so for enterprise, at, at least for enterprise, virtual AR, been, it's been useful for the last five years. It's gone mainstream, so it's not an issue. It's the consumer that's the problem, because it's still expensive. But it's gonna. Oh, well, basically, when China comes in and mass produces the headsets, it's gonna go. It, it's gonna go big fast, because it's the only the only problem right now holding back mass consumer adoption is price, and then Apple is apps. There aren't any useful apps consumers. So right now, that's why the Vision Pro, if you notice, they're not doing this for enterprise. Most of the Vision Pro guys are planning for the mass rollout for consumer because that's where the volume is going to be. So that's basically where we are now. So I, you know, I don't know when Apple's going to announce a cheaper version. They'll probably come down from 3,500 to like, you know, 2,000, 2,500, 2,000, 1,500, 1, 1,000 and a half, you know, like the smartphone, just like 10 or 15 models, different price points. But you know that's kind of what I think is going to happen. And then once that, then w once it goes beside below a thousand, then the consumer market is going to pick up. At least in terms of the advanced headsets. When I mean when I'm I'm talking really tricked out with AR, VR, everything, just like the engineers use now. Excellent. Uh, Mr. Anthony, uh, yes, my next question is to how does virtual reality technology simulate immersive environment and what are its potential applications beyond gaming? Sorry, you're breaking up. Can you hear me now? So you break, you're breaking up. You're breaking up a little bit. Uh, Mr. Rob, can you hear me? Uh, uh, hey, can I? Sorry, go on. Okay. Uh, like okay. if you share... Uh, some of your view about the applications of virtual reality in different environment. Can you hear me now? You talking to me or you talk? We Mr. just Anthony, can you hear me? Anthony's dropped. He just dropped. Sir Rob, 
Can yeah. I respond? Sir? Sure. Yes. What do you want? Uh, my my questions to you, like, how does virtual reality technology simulate immersive environment, and what are its potential applications beyond gaming? Well, I, I, I think Sheridan actually walked you through some of them. Uh, some of the more interesting ones are are um, are um, engineering related uh, simulations. Uh, the the um, the the best place, regardless of where you where you play it, the the best place to run it is is in simulation. I'm going to pass back over to Anthony because he's back now. Oh no, he's, no, I'm not. No, no, yep, yep, yeah. Okay. Um, well, as we were discussing in terms of VR and uh, how VR and the metaverse has basically revolutionised uh, all forms of social uh, media in terms of connectivity with people and so forth, in terms of VR and the metaverse. Uh, that is actually going to revolutionize um, the way we learn in terms of the metaverse, in terms of learning in the future, future education through metaverse and so forth. It's actually revolutionized so much. And it actually blurs the line of reality. As I was saying, as a philosopher, what is reality? Does the mind construct reality? How much of reality is actually real? And as I've mentioned, the eye forms an image of the outer world on the retina, which is at the back of the eye and transfers the information to the brain. And we have this feedback loop process. So consciousness is the continual creation of models. Feedback loops to describe a model of our place in space and time. Space and time is just electromagnetic field, as I have mentioned. Thus, if you truly want to understand the secrets of the universe in terms of reality, if you truly want to understand the secrets of the universe in terms of reality, and sorry, I'm coming from as a philosopher here, um, think in terms of energy, vibration, and frequency. In other words, resonance. In other words, all things exist as a dichotomy of mass and energy in this continuum of space and time, this space-time matter continuum, this Trinitarian universe of space, time and matter. Existence is mass energy motion in space and time. To be is to resonate. So as I said, the eye forms an image of the outer world then transfers the information to the brain and we have this feedback loop process that ultimately creates reality. Obviously, these headsets blur the line between reality in terms of our reality of the everyday world and so forth. So the universe, if I may say, uh, the universe, the cosmos, is a continuum with the future continually coming into existence, photon by photon. So we're talking about light, uh, light waves here, uh, particles and so forth. So as I said, I'm coming from more of a scientific and philosophical dimension and perspective. So this forms the positive negative charge of continuous flow of electromagnetic fields. We have already established that the universe, space and time is an electromagnetic field, zero point electromagnetic quanta. So, it's a, so these electromagnetic magnetic fields. Thus, the arrow of time, time if you like, is formed by the quantum wave particle function with the future continuously coming into existence, photon by photon. So basically, time is continuously being formed in the spontaneous, sorry, the spontaneous absorption and emission of light waves, photon particles, these subatomic particles. And everything, as you know, is made up of subatomic particles, these strings of light that oscillate. In fact, everything within the universe oscillates at a certain frequency. You change the frequency, you would change the structure of matter. So in a sense, we are living in a virtual reality uh, without, without, any, without any doubt about that. As I've mentioned before, we're living in a holographic uh, universe. We know this through the hydrogen collider, virtual particles that are popping in and out of existence continually. Every single point in space contains information. There's no such thing as nothing. Even nothing is something. Empty space is empty. We're living in a giant cosmic superconductor. We're living, in a sense, in a virtual reality of these virtual particles popping in and out of existence. And uh, we know this as, as a result of the hydrogen collider. So there's so basically each point in space contains information. Each point in space contains information. Excuse me. In fact, space contains, uh, thus space can store energy in these electromagnetic fields. These fields are magnetic, electrical, electromagnetic, and gravitational. Thus, there is an invisible field everywhere in the universe, and it is ultimately this invisible field that defines all of reality. So, in a sense, we are living in a virtual reality, in a very real sense, as a result of this discovery through the hydrogen collider, this giant cosmic superconductor. You change, uh, you amplify the frequency, and you ultimately change the structure of matter. So we're living in a virtual reality. So going back to what Rob said, what is reality? Does the mind construct reality? How much of reality is actually real? Are we living in a simulation? Well, there's no actual way to know that, as Rob had said. So this is a very fascinating metaphysical thing. As I said, I'm sorry, as I said, I'm coming more from a scientific, metaphysical, philosophical. As a philosopher, I'm coming from more of a philosophical dimension rather than just speaking about the, the headsets as a whole. That, as I said, blur reality in quotes, as I said, the metaverse and so forth, which is changing our way of learning in the future and so forth. The applications are without end. 
And as I said, ultimately, everything is made up of atoms and subatomic particles, strings of light that oscillate. As I said, everything within the universe oscillates. Everything vibrates, has resonance. We, to, to resonate is to be, and so forth. So uh, we, we're basically, um, we're living in this universe of oscillating particles, which we are all part of. A symphony of sounds within a complex universe of multiple dimensions and infinite realities and so forth. So this is really my uh, my my angle coming from this from a, as as a as a philosopher of science and metaphysics. So it, it's it's actually uh, very fascinating. Again, going back to the matrix, um, I've mentioned that before. We we had a discussion about that about uh, eight nine months ago with Rob and many others. And um, as I said, if we measure cosmic rays zipping through space and find that those traveling at one angle have consistently different energies from those traveling at another angle, then we know that there's a grid structure to the universe. And then this whole debate. Uh, around the matrix and uh, and so forth it comes at play. Uh, as I said, for me, we're not living in the matrix, but we are certainly living in some kind of virtual reality as a result of the uh, this giant cosmic superconductor, which defines and represents all of reality. And all of reality can be defined by these three things. We have consciousness. We have the mathematical laws that govern the laws of nature. Consciousness and the mathematical laws that govern the, the laws of nature, and of course, all of physical reality as we perceive it, that is made up of these subatomic particles. So consciousness, which is the continued creation of models, feedback loops, which describe a model of our place in space and time, the laws of nature, uh, mathematics, which govern the laws of nature, which we can't see, but they govern the laws of nature, and we can see this incredible world that we live in, encapsulated with beauty and the splendor of nature that are governed by these mathematical laws, which as a theist, I believe, was implemented by a, a, a higher power, and then, of course, uh, all of reality that can be defined by this giant cosmic superconductor that represents and defines reality as we perceive it. As I said, the eye forms an image of the outer world, transferring the information to the brain. Uh, at, at, sorry, the eye forms an image of the outer world, transferring the information to the retina, which is at the back of the brain. And we have this feedback loop process, which represents and creates all of reality. This Trinitarian perception of reality of past, present and future. So, anyway, I Thank think I... I think I've said enough there, so please, I'll... Uh, Thank yeah. you. Mr. Yeah. Rob. Yeah. Sir, I'm coming, I'm coming purely from a philosophical dimension, so please excuse me. That's all right. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Rob. Sure. The, so back to the practical uses of, of um, virtual reality. I mean, Sheridan did a nice job of talking about how, some of the architectural aspects of it. And, and, the, and really, in turn, and I've used it myself in, in terms of when we were designing a house in Belize, uh, we created it virtually first and uh, never built it, never built it because that was a whole different problem. But that, but it allowed us to, 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 you know, test our ideas, walk through the house uh, virtually, um, um, be able to make choices in terms of interior elements, furniture, uh, fixtures, uh, floor coverings, paint, uh, where to place the windows, um, all of which were done virtually and relatively inexpensive to change. So we didn't like anything. We didn't have to issue a change order. And, We'd have to have construction guys come out and do it, which is very different than we did the remodel in the house that I'm in. Now, so when we didn't like something, we had it reconstructed, and, and suddenly a $250,000 remodel became a $1.4 million remodel as it got out of control. So, the, so, the, so what virtual reality can do in a very practical sense is, is uh, through simulation, you can experiment with stuff. Um, and I mentioned with regard to training and aircraft or whatever, or tanks, uh, that you can do it without destroying a lot of things, without putting soldiers at risk or pilots at risk. Uh, but when it comes to your own personal budget or a city, as I think Sheridan pointed out, uh, you can experiment, you, you, can, you can see how things interrelate. Um, physics are part of the package now, uh, as well as now, as, as we've gone and moved into the, uh, um, into the latest form of graphics where we can really do interesting things with light. And for instance, one of the problems that occurred, I think it was on, in uh, London, was they created a, a glass building and the sun hit the building and came off it and was melting the plastic off the cars in the street. It was so hot. Um, that's something that you can now uh, discover through simulation. And before the building is even built, maybe angle it differently or use a different a glass material. Um, so you're not having to go back in and replace all those glass elements or figure out a way to shade the cars from the uh, from the sun after the fact, which is admittedly very expensive. So so you can do an awful lot of testing uh, ahead of time. Um, amusement park development, you can take people through the rides that are being built uh, before they're before they're built. So you don't have the problem that, say, Disney had with their rocket rod ride, which nobody wanted to ride because it sucked. So the so the. 
but you can simulate that ahead of time in virtual reality and, and discover that it would it would suck. And so before you build it, you can make the decision to change the design or or decide, as should have been the case in rocket rods, uh, you can decide not to do it in the first place. So it, it provides a, a way to get to the intended outcome uh, without going through a lot of the cost of having to physically alter structures to, to, to better map to the user's uh, desires. And, and, and right now we've got, a, and with artificial intelligence, we've got a, an ongoing joke going on about the fact that uh, developers are safe because users have never been able to describe what it is they want. But VR gets us pretty close because VR can put the, the user, the customer, the client, or who, whoever's making the decision uh, in the environment, they can see what it's going to look like. They can raise the things that they should have raised when they when they when they define the project. Uh, now in virtual reality, and, and correct their mistakes without the incredible cost related to it that was was uh, was the result of not having this technology um, uh, prior. So it's 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 very effective in terms of reducing costs. And in one of the areas it's being it's being used heavily now um, using Nvidia's Omniverse is uh, and in creating factories and warehouses that are increasingly um, robotic in nature. And so that, and so you're able to see how the robots would interrelate with human workers in the same space without mowing down the human workers if you made a mistake. And that, that the program that you create in the virtual world then can immediately apply to the robots in the real world. And so, that, so they enter the environment well-trained. The progress we've made with autonomous cars is largely due to the fact that they're all, I think, I don't think there's a single auto manufacturer that's not using Omniverse at the moment uh, to do automotive training. And the, and the thing with, with being able to do automotive autonomous car training using Omniverse, as much like I mentioned with aircraft, is you can create incre incredible situations. You can have it snow in Las Vegas. Uh, you, you can have it because it's it's you, you, alter, you alter the environment of the weather however, however you want, and, and you can train the uh, the ai to deal with those environments with without putting anybody at, at risk and now we've certainly seen that the artificial intelligence in the in the autonomous cars have been having a few issues with regard to pedestrians particularly in san francisco and by the way if it had been me and i was going to test autonomous cars the one place i would probably test them in last would be san francisco it's a very difficult city to drive in but the yeah. but the uh, but the uh, but in the end they've dropped them they've dropped them in there and they've had a, they've had a number of problems well to, to a large extent it's because those prior applications were largely trained on the road uh the first autonomous uh car implementations were all road trained uh, the 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 next generation will all be trained uh with a combination of on the road stuff they've already captured in simulation through omniverse which means they'll be much more able to handle a wider variety of of circumstances though i should point out that the first, this next wave of autonomous car technology is expected to be level three plus, barely level four, which means good on freeways and highways, probably not that great inside cities or places like San Francisco, which concerns me a bit about those those uh, cabs that are currently in operation. The technology isn't quite ready for those, for those situations yet, but be that as it may, the, the situations are providing a lot of training data and should allow uh, future autonomous car implement, implementations to operate more, uh, more reliably. Uh, we're going through a, a kind of a painful learning curve at the moment, but that, but uh, but for uh, but for VR, that's that's been a VR uh, that's been a, a, a major effort it's through simulation. Understand what it is you want to do, work out all the bugs in simulation before you roll it in the real world, and the end result is something that is much safer, much more reliable, and uh, and much less likely to kill the folks that are around it. Uh, AR is still in play with automotive, however. It's hasn't gone away. Um, uh, Tata, through their Jaguar unit, is still experimenting with using the windscreen as a, as a screen and using and do, using overlays for navigation, uh, hazard identification. So if you're driving down the road and there's a child running at you from the, from, the, uh, from the right and you're looking left, your screen would flash, alert you of the danger, would give you an error indication where the danger was, was approaching from. And, it, and if you had Guardian Angel, which most of the next generation of cars is going to have, and you didn't react timely, the car would react timely for you. And the, and the end result would be no dead kid. So the, so the, so it, it works in concert, but the, the, and BMW was experimenting with a headset that you would wear in the car. Um, and then if you were walking to someplace after you parked the car, you'd leave the headset on and it would provide navigational direction while you walk. The headset kind of looked like something out of uh, Phantom Menace, uh, the, the uh, however, and I'm not sure it was, it, it, it was pretty large. 
uh, that, so I'm not sure how well it would have played, but but the demonstration was good and it showcased the, the viability, the technology that we still need to do a little bit of work on on AR headsets to bring them down to the size and weight that people are going to want to wear for long periods of time. But the uh, but the background technology, the processing capability, we 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 have now achieved. So it's uh, it's now it's a case of working on some of the personalized hardware. So the so from practical applications, they're still running through. Uh, we we had a bit of a of a, a typical hill and valley where people got kind of overexcited about the technology. Uh, Google Glass kind of blew it out of the water for a while as a, as a really bad implementation of it uh, early on, which has created some significant barriers to uh, to adoption. But we're working through them, and I expect by the time we get to the end of the decade, uh, we'll be using this technology much more aggressively. When particularly when we're when we're building things, uh, the the um, as Sheridan pointed out. It's already in use, but it's 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 not in use as broadly as it should be. And then, and I think by the end of the decade, uh, we'll all have a, a certain amount of familiarity with regard to uh, how to use VR and mixed reality uh, to to alter our homes, to buy furniture, place them in our homes, and um, and um, and explore just new ways of of doing things and new experiences. I mean, imagine before you move someplace, being able to put on a set of VR headsets and experience what that place is like without having to actually move there for a few months. And um, and experiencing it real time, which, by the way, if, if anybody's ever thinking about moving to another country or even another state, you really ought to live there for a little bit of time before you make the move, because you may find, as a lot of people do, that um, that the, 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 the once you actually move there, there are a lot of things you may not have realized that that exist if you just visited. And, and, and we can get there with with VR. Now, the what the one place where VR hasn't yet played where I think a lot of us thought it was going to play is the elimination of travel. This idea of, of VR vacations um, and um, and replacing products like Zoom and Microsoft Teams with more of a VR experience. Certainly, Meta has attempted it with avatars, but the uh, but the but the breakdown in, in in that space and Microsoft tried it with holoportation was the was creating reality for all the participants. As soon as you put a headset on it breaks the sense that you're there. And, and so finding a way to digitally remove the headset, create um, uh, avatars that are photorealistic uh, real time has been a barrier and, and been a processing barrier as much as anything else to making this a reality. But it's my belief that at some point we will be able to travel virtually and travel for business will be a thing of the past. It's, it's, but unfortunately that's still a thing in our future and probably not something we're going to see um, much before 2030, if at all. But uh, but that's kind of the, the state of the union from my perspective. And I'll pass on to Sheridan. If he's still here. Sheridan, I'm still there. Fine. Yes. Um, I'll follow up with what Rob was saying. Um, two points I think are important. Um, the VR industry and AR, but especially VR, shot itself in the foot in 2015. And the reason is that they thought headsets alone without any content would sell. Well, we found out there was no reason to buy it. In fact, I met a guy and he says, I don't understand these VR guys, they're so techy, but why would you buy a television if there's no programming? And I said, good, good point. And he said, these guys are crazy. They're spending you know, thousands of dollars for, for $10,000 TVs and there's no program. Are you out of your skulls? And I said, that's the trouble with techies because they don't understand content. So but he said, so what we could have done, and in fact, um, our urban planning team, we um, did not require headsets because that's a barrier to entry because it was mobile first. Nobody had headsets back in 2015 and 16. So we designed everything for uh, flat panels, you know, smartphones, tablets, PCs, laptops, uh, big screens, projectors, and it worked because all the developers are actually building, because they're using the gaming engines, they use the big um, workstations on flat panels and they do all their 3D development in there. So we create all the virtual worlds just using flat panels on your workstations. But we used only the headset for about five to 10 minutes for QA testing to see whether, because you have to look at it from different angles to see and in simulations, you have to make sure that it works from all angles. Um, because that's how the viewers are going to see it. When we actually showed it, we um, said, you use whatever panel you want. We even had blue cube rooms at four, you know, four wall rooms um, and big screens so people could see it. 
um, in high res. So we did that. So we got around the problem with the headsets. We didn't use headsets, frankly, because nobody had them and nobody wanted to use them. Um, one advantage of using large screens is that you could show it to a lot of people at once, like the auditorium, like 3,000 people. And after the showing, we would have them come up. But the problem is every one or two headsets, you'd have to wait an hour and nobody wanted to wait, so they were all gone. So we found out that even if you had headsets and then you know the contamination plus COVID, forget it. COVID killed it, basically. You cannot share, share a headset with COVID. All right, so that's one of the things that people don't think about, but that's you know common sense from a health sanitation point of view. Now, the other one is a following on Rob's comment about simulation. Now that's where I think it's VR is gonna come in and AR is gonna come into their own. Um, and in the gaming world, it's called well, gamification, which is a dirty word in enterprise. They say, don't ever use the word gamification because that means you're screwing around, not doing your job. So they call it simulation. So we call it medical simulators, construction simulators, flight simulators, um, astrophysics simulators. So once you use the word simulation, everybody in enterprise gets it and they, they don't feel threatened. It's the same technology, it's just the labeling. So what we so now let's get specifically into simulations. We um, ran climate disaster simulations in, in um, Copenhagen and other places. So, and we, we did one for like a Florida community. We, so we ran a, a hurricane simulator um, going, starting at 70 miles an hour, 100 miles an hour, 120, 150. By 175 miles an hour, the buildings start falling apart and you know, trees started flying out. And so we recommended they design buildings more rounded without flat surfaces. So the roofs wouldn't rip off, more like flying saucers almost. And then the second we did uh, sea flooding. So we'd have waves that are like 10 feet high and it would take out all the cars in the street, just like you see in the movies or on television. And um, so we said, if you're gonna build housing, this hurricane proof in Florida in the future, you'd have to put it up 15 feet at least on steel concrete and underneath of the garden or parking. So when the flash floods come and take out everything, your house is still standing. But the building would have to look more like a flying saucer to survive 200 mile an hour winds. So you could actually, if you, um, you would have to hire aerodynamic designers from the space industry or the aerodynamics industry to design future homes. That was the conclusion we arrived at. And then we also did um, wildfires. Oh, so uh, when we did the hurricane, um, we were doing a training in Guam. And just after we left, they got nailed by that 5.0 typhoon. And it took it shut down Japan for like a whole week. So that cost them about 100, Japan $100 billion in lost economic activity or delayed activity, plus you know, billions of dollars of damage. Um, so we know that uh, hurricanes have huge economic financial damage, lives, everything. So we, I, I think that VR is really useful for climate change and climate action, which is to simulate all disasters. Um, I almost had a contract with PG&E here in Northern California for the utilities and to do uh, AR for training on machinery, you know, like warehousing. And I said, ah, that's boring. I said, why don't we simulate a fire? And they go, what are you talking about? I said, well, you know, there's fires and you guys have lines. What if we ran 100 mile an hour wind coming off the Diablo winds and, and that pg &E sets off, their, one of the wires falls down, sets off a fire and goes down 100 miles an hour, takes out all the villages below. And then, you know, they said to me, Sheridan, we don't like talking about fires around here. Can we get back to business? I said, you're going to have more fires. Six months later, campfire hit. Okay. It killed 85 people, destroyed 18,000 buildings. PG&E went bankrupt, $30 billion. The judgment was $15 billion. That cost them. And then that's $45 billion just to PG&E, right? The cost. And then you had, you know, how many hundreds of millions of dollars for all the towns and people, right? We got a lot displaced. So the the goal is you could use the simulator to anticipate what you should do, how you should design things, evacuation, things like that. So it's very practical from, from a planning, um, recovery, rebuilding point of view. So you could do disaster preparedness planning, 
You could do management while the thing's going on. We're using drones and satellite data. And then you could do rebuild the cities using VR. So that, I wrote an article about that in LinkedIn. So, I mean, I, I, I agree 100% with Rob is that simulation is probably going to be the winner. And the reason is that that's the natural gateway for all these unemployed gamers right now being laid off. And I wrote, I spoke to them last year because I knew it was coming. But all these laid off gamers could actually just take their skills going to engineering construction and get $100,000, $200,000 jobs. Building real things, not fantasy worlds now. These are real buildings. And the difference, though, is in the fantasy world, when you blow up stuff, it doesn't matter. In the real world, if something blows up or the bridge falls, you are in trouble, as we learned with uh, Baltimore. So um, I think the tolerance for error is going to be much higher. So what's good, though, is simulation, you could train again and again. In other words, if you had a pilot, jet pilot, would you like to have them fly without any practice in a, you know, a – F-35, whatever, or would you want them to run it 10,000 times in a simulator? And so we learned one thing is that you can't throw disaster scenarios at a real pilot or a real building because you can't do it because you know, lives are at stake. Um, but in the virtuality, you can do whatever disaster you want. You can simulate and train. So I think training, I, I actually see that a lot of this um, virtuality and AR developer gamers won't find jobs in another gun and shoot them down game. They're all going to get hired in medical, um, engineering, construction, um, utilities. Even insurance companies are going to hire these people to run simulations for risk assessment, you know, fire premiums, things like that. So I think that because one of the things, and we want to have AI. So the problem right now is you can see the visual destruction. What I'd like to have is AI is what's the cost of that disaster and calculate with the AI really fast. So you can actually run different simulations and then see what the damage is and then try to design differently and throw another simulation at the same simulation and see how your design reduces loss of life and loss of you know, property. So I mean, so I think simulation again is going to be a, a, the killer app. Initially for un, 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 laid off game developers who are looking for real jobs, big jobs in construction, you know, in the real world enterprise. And then I think STEM students, all STEM students in the arts who like art and music are going to start using VR and AR to train for careers in engineering, medical, insurance companies. I think it's just going to be mainstream. I think in the future, everybody who wants a good job is going to have to learn how to use VR and AR and AI. And, and so I think, Dr. Sharif, I think if your countries want to leapfrog, you really need to train them now. And the best place to start with the game developers and the AI people because they already know the technology. And if you do that, then your, your generations will be prepared for the future, which is coming pretty fast, actually. We already do it now. We just – the digital twins don't have the AI capabilities. That's the next step. So everything Rob, Rob said is that I want to see how the AI, Gen AI people play with these AI VR tools now. And what do they do with it? I mean, it's going to be really fascinating. But anyway, that's just my uh, view of the future. Well, I'll chuck in very quickly here my books, if I may, because I'm a science, well, most of you know I'm a science fiction writer anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I've just republished, I've just republished Imperial Planet. Uh, I've just republished Imperial Planet, which deals with um, philosophy of science, metaphysics, what is reality, and so forth. And I recommend it. The opening story is Mechanical Brainwave, which is basically an AI platform, Socrates, that has all the answers to life, scientifically speaking, um, cosmologically speaking, and so forth. And it's a, it's, a, it's a fantastic story, and I recommend it. So this computer, Socrates, has all the answers to life, and uh, Felix Hieronymus, a human being, basically challenges it in the end with a very theological metaphysical question i'm not going to spoil the, the short story for you but it's a very powerful story how uh, in the future this uh, computer mechanical brainwave is the name of the story mechanical brainwave how ai basically gets to a point where in quotes it becomes in quotes small g god and has all the answers to life but at the end there's a twist with the human um in terms of when the human asks it about the nature of god and reality and so forth 
and does, does God exist and does all of reality ultimately stem from an eternal source that transcends time and space, infinite in both time and space. And it goes into this very long, deep scientific dialogue with a fantastic twist. So I really recommend that. Uh, new uh, this book, me sorry, Mechanical Brainwave, Imperial Planet, which I've just republished. And there's another fascinating story there as well called Strange Visions, but I'm not going to spoil it for you. So please look out for uh, this uh, new publication or this book that I've just republished, uh, Imperial Planet. It's made up of uh, 12 short stories, uh, Rob, and, uh, and all the rest of you. Yeah. And also, very quickly, Androids and the Gods. I've mentioned this many, many times. It's one of my personal favorite books. Do Androids Dream of the Gods? Androids and the Gods. And also recommend that to our viewers uh, to, to check that book out as well. And of course, my latest publication, Under a Martian Sky. So I've been very, very busy, as you can imagine. But uh, in, in a lot of my short stories, in my science fiction books, I deal with the nature of reality from a scientific and cosmological and metaphysical perspective and, and so forth. So it's a, it's a real a mix of different short stories and so forth and novellas. So please check out my uh, my material. Thank you. No, that's great. You know, I, I I've written twelve novels about virtual reality in San Francisco. Fantastic. Okay, so it's called Can, virtual. Can you're on Facebook. You're on Facebook, obviously. Um, no, it's on uh, uh, it's on Amazon. Okay. Uh, virtually San Francisco, ten novels. Okay, well, check it out. I'll check it out. Right? And yeah, because um, I think science fiction is probably the best way to explore the future that Rob's talking about. Different, you know, well, absolutely. As, as I said, I, I'm, my, my work, my first book is Quantum Chronicles in 11th Dimension, uh, right. Imperial Planet, which I've just republished, okay. Androids mm -hmm. and the Gods. Do Androids Dream of the Gods? That's all about a robot, a robot developing a sense of theology, gravitating to a, towards a theistic philosophy. Could a robot become a believer in God? And uh, what are the metaphysical implications for humanity? Do Androids Dream of the Gods? It's a yeah. sort of a... Uh, sort of kind of like Philip K. Dick, do androids dream of the gods? And uh, so androids are the gods. Can a machine develop a sense of God, thus gravitate towards philosophical and theistic thinking? And what are the implications for humanity? Because if a machine can develop a sense of God, we need to redefine what it means to be human. We need to redefine metaphysics, the nature of the mind, the nature of the soul. What are we? So I go into some very, very deep things. But I don't want to. I don't want to get carried away here. So no, no, it's good though. But I think that's it. If you're, if you're on Facebook, add me. And we can yeah. connect. And I could even send you a couple of PDFs. Because it sounds like Blade Runner, Blade Runner meets VR and AI. Actually, talking of Blade Runner, uh, uh, Tessa right. B. Dick, uh, Philip K. Dick, who passed away mm -hmm. in 1982. Yeah. Tessa B. Dick wrote a review on my book, The Mars Time Project. Oh. So uh, I'm in good company. So, Very yeah. good. Excellent. Well, yeah. I mean, I this, is how to get, this is how to get everybody interested because everybody loves stories. And, you know, but I, I certainly recommend Imperial Planet, the new publication. Androids and the Gods, do Androids Dream of the Gods, and are Under a Martian Sky. So, uh, okay. yeah, check it out, and maybe we can connect on Facebook later. Okay, very good. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Rob, what's your closing remarks for today's session? Sure. Uh, by the way, I posted a link um, to a concept called scientific, science fiction prototyping, which is a thing mm -hmm. um, where science fiction authors are brought in to, to look at the future so that uh, remedies, defenses, um, changes can be anticipated to what governments are planning on doing in the future. It was actually heav heavily used by the Department of Defense. So it's worth checking out. Um, but uh, an application of, of science fiction writers to, 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 uh, to change the, our future reality. Uh, back, to, back to the concept. Uh, Sheridan men mentioned that the um, 2015 is being the VR disaster. I was part of that disaster. Uh, the, uh, the and it really kind of showcased the difference between the Vision Pro approach that Apple's taking and the VR approach that mostly Microsoft took back in 2015, which were cheap headsets, uh, $450 headsets, that, and no content. So the so the uh, so the experience was bad, the content was bad, and people were scratching their heads as to well, why didn't this work? Um, the, uh, Apple's done a little bit better with the Vision Pro. The 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 uh, hardware is no compromise. Uh, expensive as all get out, but it's no compromise. And so at least you get a decent experience. And for a developer, they've got something to develop against, but you, we still lack in content. But at least now they've got a path to content. Uh, mm -hmm. As we've certainly discovered with gaming systems, if, if you've got the system and no content, or got the content and no system, it doesn't work. You, you need both content and system. And we really don't have the killer app for consumer VR. Uh, yeah, and the, and the, and I think there, there are ways to create it, but the money, there just aren't enough headsets out there, even the MetaQuest headsets out there, 
to, mm -hmm. to really make a market. And the, and the, um, and so the end result is it, it just, it's just kind of dragging along until somebody comes up <laughs> with that killer app or game that people want to play. But in the end, it's VR, happy. VR it's is, uh, yeah, sure. I'm sorry. Um, we sat around with a PC in 1983 saying okay. besides spreadsheets and uh, typing, what uh, are there any killer apps? We said, and we couldn't think of any. And then we had a huge software explosion. So right. trust me, once the developers go, there's going to be thousands and thousands. Oh, it'll blow, it'll blow. I've no doubt. But but yeah. but we have but we have but we have to have adequate hardware that people can afford. And the and the right. and I agree with you. I think the the market right now is sub one thousand dollars. And the, and so you can't have a no. twenty five hundred thirty five to hundred dollar piece of hardware when the market's at sub one thousand. So the so that so that's the difficulty. And then you still need the content. I mean, you can build yeah. a great headset for under a thousand dollars, and people are still not going to buy it. Yeah. So that's that cart and horse problem we always yes. have. Here's the question, is Apple yeah. working with Foxconn in, in China to yeah. ramp out mass production of a cons yeah. thousand consumer with but, so the, so all the, the developers developing all these apps right now? That yeah, so, so the, the Vision Pro was targeted at developers. It really was a developer right. product. The plan right. was always to drop the price for a consumer right. product well below that uh, high volume product at a lower price. But I expect Apple's going to come in at $1,500 because that tends to be their target price for a more of a consumer oriented product. The market's sub 1,000, and the Delta is why they're being investigated by the uh, FTC at the moment. They're, they're carrying an exorbitant margin for the products they're selling, which has gotten them in a bit of trouble. But that, that's beside the point. Um, the, the, end, the end result is, yeah, we're, we're the, the problem I've got, though, is I don't even have a game under development I can point to is, is something that, you know, I really want to chase. And so the so the the that we're and, and we need that game. It, all it takes is one With Xbox. It was it was uh, Halo. Once they had Halo, Xbox went vertical. It just takes one thing that people want to do, and and the hardware will move. But the uh, but we're still waiting for that one thing on the consumer side. Co commercials going. It's 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 it's, it's a trend. And, so and here's so, yeah, here's a wild really idea today. Okay, it's a subscription to Taylor Swift concerts in VR. Okay. Yeah, but you still want to be there. Remember when you got a VR? A lot of people thought, you know, let's do the concert. But a lot of the concert experience is actually having your friends around you and, and feeling the right. energy of the crowd. Mm -hmm. But they we have to well, translate that to VR yet. It's, well, it's a, they it's might a do it though, because... concert on a big screen TV. You can, or at a, at a, th at a theater, it kind of gets close. But on a big screen TV, even with your family around you, it's it's not quite the same experience. If you're in there, you know, raising your arms and you're really. Oh no, no, I was thinking with it. Okay, with the headset, you have a little box like with five of you. And only five per of you could be in a room, right? In this, and you're overlooking, and you can go like floating down anywhere around Taylor Swift singing. I bet you there are might hundreds be of millions of women who will buy it. My, 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 because I can think of you watching a football game and you're wanting to see a particular play, but from a particular yeah. angle, and and, right. and and now we're capturing the games in in, in right. pretty much in full 3D. So the yeah. so the potential to use a headset and say, I, okay, I want to see that handoff. Or I want to see how that linebacker over nobody else cares about it, but you, you care because you want to be a linebacker, or maybe you know the guy or whatever. Yeah. And you want to see what they you can sit there on the field and you actually you can put yourself in the field. Hell, exactly. you can put yourself in the eyes of the player and see what the exactly. quarterback sees as they do the play. That could exactly. be kind of interesting. And then you could blend that right. with a with a okay. uh, with a computer game. So you could take yeah. what you learned from being in the head of the quarterback and take it then into a field on a computer game and without okay. breaking your arms and legs. Okay. The simple solution is I would have cut Apple should cut a deal with the NFL franchises. So each one, the like the 49ers, sell their have money to their people. Apple would like to give people money. But yeah, that, that, that would and be then, good. But the Apple Apple Apple, Apple, the 49, Apple and the NFL are gonna look at each other going, No, it's my money. No, it's my money. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they could do what you want and they could get um maybe one franchise. To money start. the roots of all evil. Right. So you know, it would be good. Anyway, I'll, 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 anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll pass on class and closing closing remarks. That, those are my closing remarks. It, it's got a lot of potential, but right now most of it's commercial. Thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. Sheridan. What's your closing remarks for today? Yeah, again, I'm just waiting for the the content to come, and and the developers are working on it now. All right, so it's going to come. Trust me. And there'll be some killer apps for um, enterprise, like medical, because I'm in medical area. And for games, and then I think, but I agree with Rob. The football games will be really huge, and then second will be Taylor Swift concerts because she's you know, so famous. Or Barbie, any kind of a Barbie world right now because you can grab all the young women. 
than that, or even older women, because I looked at the, the audience going to the movies, they, they just cleaned up financially in both of them. So I, I think this idea of it's a male world is over now. I think the female world actually might take off faster if, because, you know, then you could subscribe to concerts for any of your famous singers. And you know, so that's, that's really the business model. Thank you. Anthony, anything you want yeah, well, to add? Well, I'll just end again, really, um, just to tie it off. It's been a fantastic, fascinating discussion. And uh, as I said, you know, I uh, urge the viewers to check out my material, you know, even Beyond Earth's Horizon, my, my novella, Be Beyond Earth's Horizon, that deals with digital twins and the chips in the brain scanning all encephalic data, mind control, um, under a Martian sky, which is all to do with terraforming Mars in the future. Um, my work is very multidimensional. The Mars Time Project, as I mentioned, again, is about uh, time travel. Um, and that was reviewed by Tessa B. Dick, Philip K. Dick's wife, who's uh, obviously still alive. And she wrote an incredible review on my book, which was fantastic. And uh, Quantum Chronicles, 11th Dimension, and, uh, and Imperial Planet, which I've republished. I recommend it to all our viewers. So uh, if you're in for some very deep science fiction with a lot of science and philosophy and a journey into the future, um, I, it's highly recommended. And uh, yeah, so please check it out. And as I said, I will send you a PDF, my friend, once we connect on Facebook. OK, complimentary copy. OK. You're welcome. OK, that's that's me. Thanks. Hello. Uh, sure, he can be frozen. He's he's got to close the session off. He's gone into a state of cryogenics. Like he's his <laughs> cryogenics. Oh my God! Somebody <laughs> broke the matrix. <laughs> We're going to revive him in four thousand years, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Actually, he's, this he's, is captured in VR, right? Too. Yeah, he's he's been an avatar all along. He's fooled us. Oh, you know, it's, it's been collectively, it's been a fantastic, uh, you know, discussion. Absolutely, I know. Yeah, this yeah, is yeah, wonderful. Yeah. I love that. This one opens it up. Hello, Sharif. <laughs> Goodbye, Sharif. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're talking to a static image. Okay, well, <laughs> I guess we're asking goodbye, though, right? Or... Yeah, he'll, 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 hopefully I'll cut this all out. You guys have a great afternoon. See you next time. It was great seeing you, Rob. Take care. Bye, Anthony. Take Bye. care. Bye. 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 Bye.